So this picture, I think you may have all seen before. It's called the Blue Marble. And in fact, NASA archivist Mike Gentry has speculated that it is probably the most published image in human history. Um, this image was taken by the astronauts of Apollo 17 on their way to the moon in 1972. It wasn't the first full frame image of the Earth, but it was the first high resolution image of the, of the Earth completely illuminated because they were flying into the sun, so as they looked back, they saw the whole Earth. And it was also published in a time of, of a re, during a resurgence of environmental awareness. Really, it was the start of the Green Movement. And this image became the poster child of the Green, of the green Movement and the environmental movements. And it, if you look, you know, if you Google image of Earth, or watch a movie that has a picture of Earth, I'm almost certain it will be this image. However, if you think about mapping today and the world as we know it, we understand the Earth a little bit, but we don't really know what we're doing. If you think about this picture, the one pixel blue line is the atmosphere. That's the sense of the fragility of our planet. That was sort of the awareness people got in the 70s and the early 80s with this picture. But wouldn't it be good if we could get that all the time? Have that feeling of like, wow, this is our Earth. This is what we're doing to it. But if you look at maps today, we have all of these great things like Google, Map, Google Maps and Mapbox and Bing Maps and, and so on, you know, Google, Google Street View. But how many people have, have a house that hasn't been updated on the maps for years, right? It's, maps are out of date. In fact, the average age of Google Maps is about 36 months. And there are images there that are over 10 years old. So I just want to tell you about a company that I've started working on to solve this problem. <coughs> and also a little bit about the story of how we chose to solve this, how to solve this really big problem, and what the small devices were in the end that are going to enable us to do that. So when I was at NASA, my mentor there, Pete Klupa, used to pull his phone out of his pocket and wave it at people and go, why are spacecraft so expensive? You know, why are, they, why are the computers 20 years old? Why is the camera on, on the Mars rover only two megapixels? My, my smartphone is better than your spacecraft. <laughs> he, he would put it back in his pocket, though. And so one day, some colleagues and I decided, let's take him up on that challenge. So the first thing we decided to do was try and break some phones. And so this is a, this is a, a smartphone in a vacuum chamber. We wanted to know if they would work in space. First test, do they work in, in a vacuum? So it turns out most of the electronics in modern consumer devices today are pretty much made in very sterile vacuum-like conditions anyway. A lot of them are actually made in a vacuum. So in a sense, this was just like going home for the phone. So here this phone is at 10 to the minus 6 Tor, which is almost the vacuum of space. And it was just fine. It just kept working. And so we ran back with this result, and we're like, <laughs> it works. It's crazy, but it works. Um, so we thought we were onto something. The next thing was, well, OK, um, you know, how tough are these things? So we put some on some rockets. Now, the first rocket that we put it on had a bit of a failure. And the parachute came out on the way up. And so suddenly the rocket turned around, and the parachute ripped off. The rocket broke into pieces, came back into the ground, hit the desert. Um, we dug it out of a six foot deep hole with shovels. There were a couple of experiments in there. The biggest was about this long. It had compressed down to about that big in the impact and had landed on the phone. But the phone was still working. <laughs> so if you think about it, this is not really surprising because phones are designed to be handled by very, very clumsy humans. And so phones are tough. And in fact, I used to get my phone and prove it by bouncing it like a tennis ball off three walls. And it would usually work, but after about a 1,000 times, it finally died. But phones are tough, and they can launch and survive rocket rides. and. Uh, this is a neat little video of us testing one. And so we have on the left the view from the phone, and from the right, us watching the rocket launch here. And here we have the accelerations that the phone is experiencing as it launches on this rocket. And as we get to the top here, in a minute, the rocket will roll over. Things will slow down. And here we're at about 30,000 feet. 
and then the parachute on this one came out at the right time, which is about now. And then we come back down to the ground. So this data was taken with the sensor that was in the phone and the video as well. So we had a neat little package. If you think about it, phones are great. They have computers, they have storage, they have sensors, they have radios, all these kinds of really neat things you might need for a spacecraft. So we thought about building one. And there are these neat things that were invented about 10 years ago called CubeSats, which are 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cubes that fit into a standard pod on a rocket, and they just get pushed out with a spring. So we put a phone inside one of these boxes with some extra batteries, and attached in yellow, you can see another antenna. And just for scale, it really isn't much bigger than a coffee mug. And when I say put a phone in, I literally mean put a phone inside. <laughs> So this is just a Perspex model to show you really what was inside. We ended up using a few more batteries. All this empty space here we packed with batteries. Um, but it was a phone. And in fact, it was just a, a complete phone with the screen and everything. And we just built a little USB connector to run charging to the batteries and connect to the radio. So uh, we called this PhoneSat. And uh, in April this year, we launched some into space. This is actually a picture of the phone attached to a balloon in a pre-launch test that we did. Um, and so this is the phone set. You can actually see just up, up in the top, you can see the, the angle of the phone there and a lot of the green batteries and the antenna. So this was a pre-flight balloon test we did to see if we could actually communicate with the thing. And then in April, launched them. And this is one of the pictures we got back from space. Um, this was really fun because what we did was we decided not only did we want to test these phones, we wanted to get the message out to a lot of people. And so instead of using one NASA ground station to get the data, we crowdsourced the delivery of all of this data. And so we chopped the images up into thousands of tiny little blocks, 200 bytes long, and sent each block down, which was actually an image that you could view. It was, a, it was a complete viewable image, correct file format, but it was only 200 bytes in length. And we sent them, we radiated them over the whole Earth, just beaconing them out, like little messages, messages in bottles. And we had about 40 people around the planet who had ham radio gear pick these up and email back the packets so that we could reassemble the image. So this is a picture of one of these photos from space taken with the phone camera being reassembled. So at this point, we thought we were really onto something. We had a cheap system. We could take photos. But we wanted to do better than this. So maybe a phone wasn't exactly the right thing. But there had to be something that would help us solve this problem of building scalable, cheap computing systems that could help us map the Earth better. So the first thing we needed to do was improve the camera. And we also wanted to make some upgrades to the electronics. Phones aren't great for connecting because you only have really one port. So we needed a generalized computer that we could connect a lot of things to. So we graduated from phones and built this. And this is what we call Dove. The reason why it's called Dove is because a lot of spacecraft often have really, I guess, aggressive names like Talon and Raptor. But we wanted something that was kind of a bit more fun and peaceful, you know? So our intention is to launch a flock of doves into space and map the Earth. The key component is a super high resolution camera. We have, a, we have an industrial grade robotics camera at the back that actually connects to a computer over, over Ethernet. And the entire spacecraft can be accessed via the web from the ground. Some people would call this a satellite. I actually just call it a webcam in space. So what we'd like to do, so then what we wanted to do was we wanted to launch some of these. So we actually purchased two launch vehicles, um, one out of the United States from uh, Orbital Sciences Corp, the new Antares launch vehicle, and also a Soyuz in Russia. We hoped to space these apart by about six months so that we could launch one, and then in the sort of spirit of Silicon Valley, iterate, release early, release often, and iterate a second time <laughs> on the Soyuz. But what happened was the schedule slipped, and over a two-year period, these two launches ended up being three days apart. <laughs> but it gets better. The Soyuz launched first. And we were attached to the capsule that, that, of which the Russians were using for, for a variety of science experiments. And we were going to stay in orbit for three days until they released us. So what happened in the end was while we were in our mission control center, waiting for the first pass of Dove 2 to go overhead, Dove 1 launched within seconds. And the engineering team were watching the screens, watching the webcast from, from Virginia of the Antares' maiden flight. And I'm like, guys, 
like we got 20 seconds, and we actually got to see the thing go all the way up to first stage separation, and then we switched back, and we contacted Dove2 on its first pass, um, which was really exciting. I mean, you had to be there, but it was just so crazy to see those two events converge over a two-year period down to seconds. And so then what did we get? So we got this. It was about 4 o'clock in the morning, and we were downloading the pictures over FTP, as you do from a webcam in space. <laughs> and uh, I emailed it to my two co-founders, just saying, you know, we have a picture. So one of them, Will, woke up at about 6 in the morning, read his email, and apparently he tells me he stayed in bed for three hours crying, looking at this picture. He was so moved by what we'd, actually, we'd been able to capture with this spacecraft. So this was you know, really exciting to the whole team as well because forests, forests and, and managing deforestation and managing resources on the planet is one of our key issues that we'd like to address. And so this picture really nailed our first use case. And in fact, if you compare this photo to photos that are online now, you can actually see where certain trees have been removed. And so one thing I'd like to be able to do is count every tree on the planet. I think that would be really neat to do. Um, following that, we're like, what next? This is the problem statement at the moment. Maps are infrequent. Satellites, really big ones, are kind of like point and shoot cameras. They're like, wow, there's something interesting. Let's take a look at that. Next door, but hey, I want to look at that thing again. When you're pointing and shooting, you're missing other stuff. What would happen if we could launch enough spacecraft that we could map continuously all the time? And so that's what we're proposing to do. So yesterday morning at 7 a.m., I delivered 28 spacecraft to Houston for launch into space. And uh, we're hoping by next year, when the satellites are commissioned and operational, to be providing complete coverage of the planet and every quarter to provide an updated base map of what our planet looks like. This is our team. I'm really proud of them, of what they can do. And I think it's amazing what a small group of people can do to address a really big challenge. Thank you.